how do we actually get rid of microplastics out of our body? That's the big question. I didn't even want to do a video on microplastics because I figured it would just concern people about something that is very hard to avoid in our environment. But it's become so glaringly clear that this is something that is problematic and how it gets in our organs. We just need to learn how to get rid of them. And this video is going to be all about the particular detoxification pathways and how we can look at the literature to really see how do we get rid of microplastics. But before we do that, we do need to talk about like what organs microplastics are going in and some of the evidence we're seeing. So it's pretty worrying stuff. And I don't want to emphasize a lot of like the fear mongering part. I want to get right to what you can do. But stick with me on this because we got to learn about them first before we can talk about how to get rid of them. It helps you understand the whole process a little bit more. Also, drop a comment down below for the algorithm. It really does help this channel out. And also, subscribe if you haven't already. We've got content dropping every single day. So before we get into the details of microplastics, I also put a link down below for 30% off through Thrive Market. It's an online membership-based grocery store. Right now, there's a lot of focus on how European foods have higher quality ingredients than American foods, and that's a real thing. And it's something that I've liked about Thrive Market for the last practically a decade is that they've had focus on this long before it was popular, right? They were really focusing on high quality ingredients in their food. And that is exactly what they're about, making good quality food accessible. So that link down below gets you 30% off your entire first grocery order through Thrive Market, and then it gets delivered right to your doorstep, no matter where you are in the country. So it's making it so it's accessible to get good quality food that we might only have at like expensive grocery stores in Southern California or something like that. So it's really cool, and I love that they're putting the ingredient quality first. So that link, 30% off, plus a free gift when you use my special link in the top line of the description down below. Now, Recently, there was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It took a look at 304 people that were looking at uh, carotid artery disease. So they're looking at their heart, they're looking at plaque. What they found, bottom line, is that 60% of the people in this study ended up having polyethylene, plastic particles, in the plaque itself, and 12% had polyvinyl chloride, PVC. What's even scarier is that the more plastic they had, the more at risk they were for heart attack or stroke. So essentially, even the plaque that's in our cardiovascular system is ending up like with plastic in it. Like that's gonna be even worse than regular plaque because it's literal plastic, right? It's getting wild. Let's talk about a couple of the other organs and how it's absorbed first. So there was a study that was published in the International Journal of Pharmaceuticals that found that microplastics are simply absorbed through the blood. Just like when we consume food, the smaller the plastic particles, the easier they are absorbed through the intestinal tract, into the bloodstream, and into literally all tissues. So I can spare you the time, tell you that it pretty much is going into all tissues. But we're seeing worse off in the brain, the testes, the lungs, and the heart. At least that's where we're recognizing them the most. Not to mention also within the intestinal tract. So what are these things doing to us? We don't fully know the answer, but it's not good. There's links with all kinds of issues at this point, including cardiovascular disease. So let's just get into how we can actually flush them in a real scientific way. And again, I ask you once again, please do drop a comment for the algorithm. I can't overemphasize how much that helps. In any future videos, just drop a quick comment. It helps us out a ton. So first we look at the gut, because there was a study that was published in the journal Total Environment. This was interesting. They found that microplastics ended up in the stool of every participant tested. What does this mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that plastics are in the gut. I mean, yes, they are. But what it means is that the more microplastics that we can get moving through the gut, the less they will absorb, right? It's kind of like when you measure fat in the stool. Like, a lot of times, doctors will look at fat in the stool, like does the stool float, because it tells you how much fat are you absorbing. If more is moving out through the stool, you might not be absorbing it in the bloodstream. The same implies with plastics. The more plastic we can move out through the stool, the less we potentially absorb because it's absorbing like regular food. So how do we increase this? The first thing that we have to look at is gut barrier integrity. Our first line of defense from microplastics is our gut barrier integrity. Now, that does not stop us from what we breathe. That does not stop things like that in our skin. We're seeing all this, water, skin, you know, what we breathe. But at least orally ingested plastics, when you take a sip of water or these 
nanoplastics, which are the things that are practically undetectable until they accumulate within our body. Again, we need them moving through the system and we need them to not absorb. So gut barrier integrity. A couple of things that you can do to increase sort of the, the health of that gut mucosal layer so that plastics don't absorb as much. Collagen, bone broth, Okay, these things are really important. Glutamine, now I know people have concerns with glutamine because it can fuel certain cancer cells and things like that. That is less of a concern, believe it or not, as long as you are supplementing just an adequate amount of glutamine to be able to protect the gut. You don't need much, a couple grams per day, maybe even five grams every other day, especially if you're active. So if you're working out, you do wanna support with some glutamine because it can help repair that gut intestinal layer and prevent the gut permeability, where you have the tight junction proteins, protein junctions, that would allow plastics to get through. Zinc supplementation, 25 milligrams per day, can help tremendously with that gut barrier integrity. But then we go to the things you may wanna consider avoiding. I talk on this channel a lot about polysorbate 80, 20, and 60. These are emulsifiers that are literally in so many foods, but quite virtually used in research to induce intestinal inflammation because they basically emulsify the gut lining. So when you take polysorbates, emulsifiers, you're making it so plastics can absorb easier if you're not careful. I don't know why this stuff is in food, and just because there's not a lot of human trials showing the danger of it, we know mechanistically what it does. They use it on rats, they use it in all kinds of studies with animals to literally induce inflammation by damaging the gut. So that would be a great thing to avoid. Of course, also reducing stress. Stress is gonna damage the gut. Excess exercise stresses the gut, right? So we gotta pay attention to these things. Inflammatory things in general. I have other videos on that. I can link out to them down below on inflammatory foods, et cetera, things like that. Uh, another one that's a little bit more questionable, that doesn't have the evidence behind it as much because there's just not those cohorts, but colostrum has promising effects on gut health, so just look into that. Here's where things get really interesting though. With soluble fiber specifically, I know people have opinions on fiber, but soluble fiber does something unique with microplastics. There's something called bile acid sequestration and microplastic binding. So essentially, microplastics can actually bind to the bile acids and cause them to flush out. Pretty wild. So what actually happens is soluble fiber binds to the bile acids and then can trap fat soluble toxins such as microplastics and nanoplastics and then they flow out with the stool. Now, some of this is in early theory, but it absolutely has other benefits too to add soluble fiber. So it's not like a risky business kind of thing. So things like chia, things like flax, things like glucomannan fiber, shirataki noodles, little bits of soluble fiber, okay? Pay attention to these sorts of things. Chicory root, inulin, they swell up, they, can, they hold water when they swell up, but they also attract those bile acids and attract those fat soluble toxins, can secrete them out. So we see some evidence with this in the early model stuff and it's worth a shot. Another thing that the soluble fiber does is it can increase how quickly things through, move through transit. So if things are taking a long time, for example, like Ozempic, for example, that's going to slow down digestion, which means things absorb a little better sometimes, including plastics. So if you're adding fiber and you move things through the, through the overall intestinal tract a little faster, and thereby you're gonna have less absorption of those microplastics, potentially. Now the World Journal of Gastroenterology published something interesting on the gut microbiome. They actually found that the gut microbiome has what is or does what is called microplastic degradation. So when we are tilted towards the healthier bacteria, like the lactobacillus and the sort of um, bacteroidetes, some of these other ones, so many good ones, bifidus, we actually have more degradation of these microplastics. But the research is so early right now, the common theme is saying, hey, just have gut diversity, right? So fiber, things that are good for the gut, maybe some apple cider vinegar, some prebiotics, things like garlic, those things can help us out in that world, but we need more research there. Now the next category is the hydration piece. People really underplay the value of drinking water for real, true flushing out. It does work, and here's a few reasons why. For one, kidneys. More water is going to be a higher filtration rate. It's not about the kidney health, so to speak. It's about making it so that more is filtered through the kidneys. So yes, 
you can move more microplastics potentially through the kidneys if you have a higher filtration rate. It's like if you had a strainer and you were had some like sediment in there and you were like trying to filter that sediment and you were dribbling water on it versus pouring water on it, it's gonna have a different effect over a faster period of time, right? Now the other piece is the liver. Remember that hydration and moving fluid through is key for that filtration. It's also key for the movement of bile acids through the liver and ultimately the bile acids that are gonna potentially bind to the microplastics. So we're flushing things faster. Now again, is there solid evidence directly with microplastics and hydration? No, but we have to connect dots because it's early. And unfortunately, a lot of people would hydrate with a plastic water bottle, so be aware of that, of course. The other piece that the American Journal of Physiology published about that people don't understand is the lymphatic system. We hold microplastics in our tissues. The lymphatic system can help flush those things. People think that since the lymphatic system does not have a heart, right, it doesn't like pump with lymphatic fluid, doesn't pump with a heart, it pumps with movement, which is important, but they forget that just because it does that, that hydration doesn't play a role. Well, the study that was published in the American Journal of Physiology showed that hydration does improve the lymphatic flow. So more water actually increases that lymph fluid moving and flushes it out. Okay, so more hydration plus actual movement, you're going to flush this, you're going to move these things and actually get the lymph to move the potential microplastics out of the tissues itself. The last category we need to look at is glutathione support, GSH, right? Now, you could go and take glutathione directly. There's evidence in both directions whether that works. I'm a fan more of glutathione precursors, sulfur-containing foods, so eating things like eggs, eating things like broccoli, other cruciferous vegetables, okay? These things are really important. You can also eat garlic and onions and leeks. These provide sulfur that is a precursor to form glutathione. This is really critical because glutathione isn't necessarily going to get rid of the microplastics, but it's going to potentially modulate the inflammation that comes along with the microplastics that allows the system to work better, reduces the inflammation within the gut, so you can kind of close a loop a little bit. You can also take things like N-acetylcysteine, NAC, or alpha-lipoic acid, ALA. Okay, I would recommend in that case like 600 milligrams of NAC a day for a little while. Okay, and alpha lipoic acid, you can kind of play around with the dose there. You usually don't need too much. And you'll notice it. You might even feel a little bit clearer with it. The other thing that you want to do is you want to avoid things that deplete GSH. Okay, things that deplete the sulfur or deplete the actual glutathione itself. So you want to avoid things like alcohol or excess sugar, right? These things can cause some damage there. The more you deplete that, the harder it is to rebuild it. So while you're taking things like NAC and ALA and eating these sulfur-rich foods, you wanna reduce alcohol and you wanna reduce excess sugar so it can actually do its job. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to leave a comment and subscribe and I'll see you tomorrow.